Almost. So it will affect the longest arteries and nerves in the body. So it starts at the tips of the toes and moves backwards. Your feet are so important. In fact, there are 162,000 of those small sensory nerves per square inch. Most highly populated on your hands, your bottom of your feet, your lips, your tongue, and your sexual organs. They give us pleasure and they protect us. We get to, the food we eat today will be the taste buds are like these small sensory nerves. If you're walking and you have a little pebble in your shoe, you know to move, take that shoe off and take that pebble out, right? If you touch something hot, those small sensory nerves are what keep you safe and move your hand away. So, plus your feet are 60% of your balance. So if you start losing sensory feeling in your feet, that's when your balance starts going. That's when you go to a cane or a walker. It's important to understand the physiology behind our skin. It is our largest organ our body has. The top layer keeps us safe and keeps foreign antigens and germs out. So that's called the epidermis, then you have the dermis, then you have the subcutaneous. You have arteries and veins running in that subcutaneous. That's fat, it's protected by fat. Arteries carry oxygenated blood away from the heart. Veins pick up deoxygenated blood and bring it back. There are smaller tributaries that you're going to see. These are capillaries that help bathe this tissue with oxygen-rich blood. And we need those nutrients and oxygen for that tissue to survive. Okay? So this is important. A lot of patients with full-blown neuropathy, they won't sweat anymore. They'll lose their hair follicles as well. And these are the small sensory nerves that are most at risk when you have diabetes. So, these are different, these are thin, these are naked. They're not like the larger branches that have a protective coating around them, that myelin sheath. So these are much more susceptible to changes in our environment. So it could be chemotherapy, it could be anesthetics, it could be high blood sugar, you name it. Different drugs will affect those. Some strong antibiotics. And that's what we're looking at. These are the sensory nerves that pick up coolness, heat, vibration, sharpness, those type of things. But if they're not getting oxygen and nutrients, just like a plant will wilt or go into a dormant state, these nerves will do that as well. And our research is showing that's where the source of most of the pain is coming from. I always like to say in our 20s and 30s, our small sensory nerves would be like this. We have 100% function in those small sensory nerves. Each decade of life, we lose a little bit of those small sensory nerves. So, by the time you come into my office in your 60s or 70s, you lost 60% of those. Now you can't feel the, the ground. You might take smaller steps looking at to make sure you don't trip out everything or anything. You can't walk over irregular terrain. You know anybody like that? The definitive diagnosis for diabetic nerve pain is really a skin punch biopsy. That's where they take a small little three millimeter punch just below your ankle, and they set that up to a lab up in Alpharetta called Baco Laboratories, and they put that slice of skin underneath uh, an electron microscope. So this is healthy. This is that epidermis, this is the dermis. These are the small sensory nerves. Now watch this. This is someone with full-blown diabetes. See the difference? You don't have to be a pathologist. That top layer looks atrophied or thin. It doesn't, they don't have a lot of padding on the bottom of their feet. It's tender to walk. Their balance is off. The dermis area doesn't look good at all. This looks like a dry, arid desert. Nothing's growing there. This all started, this is my mom, Mickey DeDuro, McKella. And my mom was a type 2 diabetic back in 2000. She came back from a trip visiting my brother in Italy where he was getting a, uh, uh, a diplomat in neurology. And when she came back, her doctor did some, her yearly test, did her blood work, and he saw that her cholesterol was 187. And 
he started her on a half a dose, which was five milligrams of Lipitor, or a statin cholesterol lowering drug. How many of you are on statins? Raise your hand. Could be Avastatin, Lipitor. Raise them high. Let me see. Yeah. You're going to see it's the most profitable drug in the history of pharmaceuticals. And there's actually a link between being on Lipitor and developing type 2 diabetes. It's a class action lawsuit. Did you know that? So my mom, just three weeks after taking this half a dose of Lipitor, she developed what's called rhabdomyosis and deep nerve pain. Rhabdomyosis is where your muscle breaks down and protein gets into your blood. She became very weak. She couldn't get out of her, out of her bed. We had to get a walker from a neighbor. Um, she went from a walker. We had to take her by wheelchair to doctors. And we went to doctor after doctor after doctor trying to find out. Has anybody heard that story? You go to doctor after doctor after doctor. Nobody knew what was wrong with her. In fact, one doctor, a famous neurosurgeon, Webster Pilcher in New York, he told my mom if she didn't have back surgery, that she'd be in a wheelchair the rest of her life. We just didn't believe it. My brother and I, we said, you know, our parents didn't get us to this point in our life and help us with schooling and help us go to doctorate schools just to leave them in a wheelchair. So we did every, you know what it's like. Necessity is the mother of invention. And, and it's 17, 18 years ago, this is what we had to do. We hated seeing our mother in so much pain. She was taking five or six pain pills per day. She wasn't doing well. And I remember, this is when Google was getting big. We Googled her symptoms from the rhabdomyosis. The first thing we did is took her off the, the statin drug. But she continued to be weak. We took her to therapist, acupuncture, massage, physical therapist. Nothing was helping. <coughs> And we read this article on Google about this famous horse trainer up in Kentucky who were using these new laser pads, they were called equine pads, to help rehabilitate these injured racehorses who would have been put down and euthanized, but instead they were trying some alternative therapies to help them rebuild the muscles and some of the soft tissue. So we tracked down where this guy got them from, we talked to him, he pointed us in the right direction. And we bought our first two pads that were equine pads for my mom. And we got her blood sugar in check. We changed her diet to more of a ketogenic diet. And I'll talk to you about that in a little bit. Um, and then we started applying these, these equine pads, not even cleared for human use. And we used them. And after the first week, my mom was able to um, get around with her cane a little better. And the second week, she said she was sleeping better. And by the third week of using them, she was down to one or two pain pills just in the evening before she went to bed. So we knew we were onto something. And it really drove my brother and I to go deeper. My brother actually went, in 2006, went to University of Iowa and Palmer College and got a master's degree in clinical research. And that's where he developed this protocol. So there's diet. Not only did we detect and help you get your blood sugar back in, 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 in order, but we'll also have a treatment to help you with that type of nerve pain. This is my mom and brother in their kitchen in New York, and they're making homemade sauce and pasta. You know that drug Lipitor? It went on to become the most profitable drug in the history of pharmaceuticals. And I was lucky enough to speak in San Sebastian, Spain, where I presented that paper in 2017. And what I realized was, after I did this little talk, or orthopedists, neurologists, urologists were coming up, and they're like, you know, we don't have that statin problem in, in Europe. I said, what do you mean? Explain. He goes, well, we use it as what's called a stopgap drug. I'm like, yeah? That means if your cholesterol goes high, we may put you on it for six or eight weeks, you meet with an exercise physiologist, you meet with a nutritionist to make sure you're eating properly, and then when your levels get back in check, we take you off it. But what do they do here in the States? Yeah. Keep you on it forever. Well, folks, you don't have to be a pathologist to understand this. If you have a healthy person and you give them a drug every day, 
What do you think happens to their body? Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. Even, you guys know who Clark Howard is? In May of 2017, he nearly died. He was in the hospital for three weeks, intensive care for one week. He was... Um, diagnosed with rhabdomyolysis after being on statins and an antibiotic. So this is much more common. Who here is tired of taking medications? Good. That's right. Do you know the average person in the United States is given, is prescribed 12 new prescriptions per year? Thank God we can't afford to fill them. Unless we live in Mexico or Canada, right? Our meds are so, so expensive. We talked a little bit about this, but the strong prescription drugs that are out there, the things for pain, oxycodone, Percocets, those type of things, they're a tough, tough um, drug to be on. And I have a whole hour long talk on it. I could go on it, but I will say this. You know, we do have a drug war. We do, we, we're losing the drug war, both prescription and illicit. And if you look at the aviation industry, there's only been one death since 2009 in the whole aviation industry. Did you know that in America? That lady that was just out of Southwest flight was sucked out of a yeah. terrible, out of the window and she died. But the aviation industry will go and change all of their policies just to save or protect one life. It's not happening in medicine. Medicine is an industry here in the States. You understand that? It's an industry. And unfortunately, they think 60,000 people per year dying from prescription drug overdose is part of the war. It's terrible. And one of the things I ask, and you'll see afterwards, why this is happening. Here's an amazing stat. The U.S. consumes over 80% of all medications produced in the world today. 80%, folks. And here's something surprising. We're only 5% of the world population. Why is that? I don't think America runs on Dunkin' Donuts anymore. <laughs> Follow the money. How much do we spend on health care? Trillions. 3.2 trillion dollars. More than any other industrialized nation in the world. But this industry is interesting. We have the most doctors, the most hospitals, and we spend the most amount of money. Where do we rank in comparison to the other 50 industrialized nations? Where do you think we are? We're not even in the top 10 anymore, folks. We're number 37, just behind Costa Rica. Sad. So what's causing it? See, we have a, an idea that it's because the average home has two washing machines. One that washes the clothes, and one that brainwashes you. <laughs> it's called social conditioning. In, in, in England, they call it the boop tube, because your brain goes soft when you watch too much TV. Yeah. And I will tell you, who's old enough to remember when there were cigarette commercials out, out there? Right? Yeah, I was all you. The Paul Mall lady, the Marlboro Man, you know. But what happened when the CDC realized there was a link between smoking and cancer? What happened? They pulled the commercials. Big Tobacco got sued and went bye-bye. Folks, guess who replaced Big Tobacco? Deal. Deal. Big Pharma. That's what it did. And something happened in 1996 that was not on your radar, but was ours in healthcare. What happened was CDC and the FCC started allowing pharmaceutical companies to directly market to you and your families. And this is where we started taking a nosedive. Okay? And I remember the first drug uh, commercial. I couldn't believe it. 1996. This lady is walking through the park. She's got a dog. And there's purple pill following her. 
And for the first 15 seconds, this announcer is telling you how wonderful this drug is and everything great about it. And the next 45 seconds, he's telling you all the bad side effects. And don't take if you're pregnant. It may cause kidney failure, right? And then they have the gall at the end to say, ask your doctor if this drug is right for you. <laughs> they didn't even tell us what the drug was. Yeah. But folks, it must have worked because in 2007, uh, 2018, these yeah, advertisers, or these pharmaceutical companies spent $7 billion marketing to you and your family. See, this is where I think it stops. There's only two countries in the world that allow this. New Zealand, in the United States, both of which have the highest health care costs, number one and number two, in the world. Wow. You ever see that movie, Network? I'm tired and I'm not going to take it anymore. Yeah. That's what we have to start doing. We have to actually talk to our senators and congressmen and tell them, we don't need this anymore. Neurontin or gabapentin, this is a big one. A lot of people, like you heard that lady, it's an anti-seizure medicine. It doesn't fix these people's problem. Lyrica or Cymbalta. Do you know Lyrica and Pfizer, they spent $250 million to copyright the phrase diabetic nerve pain. That's why I use it so much. Because it's so common. Cymbalta is now has a black label warning on it may cause suicidal yeah. thoughts. Yeah. You know, from doing this talk over the last nearly three years and speaking to over 5,000 people, I've had dozens of women, and mostly women, that come up to me and they'll, they'll whisper, well, I was on that drug, I had suicidal fantasy. She had thoughts of that. What if Miss KJ and her depression was linked to the meds they were giving her? Right? Sometimes the cure is worse than the disease. I don't want you to stop and take an insulin. Understand that. Right. But all the other things they give you in accordance may be having some issues. We're treating ourselves worse than we treat our cars. And the average American goes through 11 cars in their lifetime. Guess what, folks? You only got one body. And you better treat that body like a temple. Because that's it. So if you saw this check engine light, uh-oh, what did I do now? Sorry? If you see this check engine light come on, that's your body's way of telling you, yeah, we got some issues. If you saw that in your car, what would you do? We had one lady in Douglasville said, my husband put a piece of electrical tape over it so we didn't have to see it anymore. <laughs> You and I know we can't drive that car much longer. And same thing with our body, right? If we're getting that pain and symptoms that we talked about, that's your body's internal alarm clock telling you we need some help. And that's why we're here, to tell you about doing some of these screening tests early before you develop some of these late stage issues. So what is diabetic nerve pain? Who knows that guy? Dr. Oz. He keeps getting older, he keeps looking better than me. I've seen him a couple times. My wife, we saw him on TV today, my wife said, he's got some work done. <laughs> it's a damage to or disease affecting the nerves can be associated with the feet, legs, arms, hands, and back. Okay? So it affects those extremities. That's why you gotta be aware of it. You should get baseline studies to see how your sensory nerves are working now, functioning now. It's like electrical cord. If there's a little nick in it and you can see that copper lining, that might not send the electrical activity from the outlet through the wire to say a toaster oven. Some days it may toast the bread perfectly. Other days it may burn the toast. Other days it may spark and cause a fire. Right? That's the same thing with diabetic nerve pain. Your body is not interpreting the message is properly from the brain down outside. I had one patient, his name was John from Dahlonega, during the winter a couple years ago. He put his bare feet up against the glass plate of a fireplace and got second degree burns. 
His wife walked in and said, what's that smell? It was his feet burning against the glass plate. So don't tell me it's just a little numbness. Don't tell me that I can't feel the hot water when I get in the tub with my toes. I gotta use my hand or elbow. It's quickly becoming one of the most common diseases and chronic conditions in the country. Close to 30 million people now have diabetic nerve pain. Closer to 100 million people have diabetes. Can happen at any age, but usually affects older patients. 72% of our patients